Okay, I actually have my notes here. All right, so we do the good, the bad, the ugly approach. Is that uh, still on the table? Yeah. Well, okay, so the good was that I got feedback from the community, so they're actually watching these videos, and uh, I got some compliments on that, so that was good. I spent some time with one of our uh, members and uh, who's very cognizant and up to speed on precise, and we had a good conversation or two about wake words and training and data sets and all of that. And so that's very refreshing to know that there's people out there that are actively engaged and watching these videos. Um, so that was the good. I also gave him a, a copy of the model I gave to both Gez and Josh, uh, and he's gonna test it as well. And so that's good. Um, I created a wiki page with installation instructions for new models, uh, that was good. And everything else was either bad or ugly. Uh, so let's see. So the first uh, issue was the, da the data purge. Um, the, the subdirectory is so large, and it's a, it's a NAS, that it's going to take 26 days. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's seven, 75,000 files have to be removed, and the RM command takes about five minutes per file. So um, the solution is, Josh, if you can get me access to the actual server that the NAS lives on. <laughs> Sorry, that's very funny. Yeah, so if you can get me access to the server that the actual drive lives on, rather than having to go over the network, I could probably get it done faster um, I certainly didn't want to fire it off and let it run for a month because a day or two, great. A, a month, yeah, I don't know. So that was one of the bads. Um, let's see, uh, I'd added an image to the data pipeline wiki, which I'm, you know, hoping I'll get feedback on and it looks, uh, you know, like a, uh, I think in pictures. So uh, it's a picture of how the, the data pipeline um, should probably look from end to end. Uh, but the bad and the ugly were, well, the, uh, the downright ugly was I got caught on a rabbit hole Tuesday. I got stuck on a problem with precise studio stuff I was building, and I ended up staying up until 5 in the morning working on it. And uh, I'm getting too old for that, and um, I wasn't able to get up before 11 the next day, and I was shot. So I got to try to balance that out. But, uh, yeah, uh, so I, I mean, I, I know what the problem is. It was basically I want you to be able to record right from the studio, and, JavaScript records in WebM format and odd container, and I got I was trying to get JavaScript to convert it and ship up a wave, but I can just use FMPEG up on the uh, server and do it. So, you know, I know the solution. It just I was being stubborn, so that took me. Uh, that was ugly. Um, you know, the, the fact that it was going to take 26 days to purge the data is ugly. I'd like to get access to that server and get it out of our hair today. Uh, and that's basically it for me. Um, the Precise Studio. I moved it from being a uh, CGI that required a server or an environment to a Python uh, script that runs simple HTTP server with the objective being that when you check out the code line, there's a subdirectory that has everything for training in it you need. You, you click on this link and it brings up a web interface and you can create your models and test your models and add and delete from your data sets and move stuff around and test models and all of that without ever having to use the command line. I mean, over the last month or two, I've been building up a bunch of scripts from the command line to simplify the process, and this is just a uh, manifestation of that. So that's kind of what I was working on. I uh, didn't make as much progress as I would have liked to, but uh, I did get a couple of models into people's hands, and I, I think I got some positive feedback, uh, at least from Gez, um, and hopefully I'll get some from Josh and the other community members, so we'll see how that works. But uh, yeah, that's my update. It's, it sounds like some of the stuff you're doing might overlap with some of the stuff we have planned for um, the community precise stuff, like being able to submit wake words, um, you know, through with the web. So I want to make sure we're on the same page with. Um, yeah, no, it's what. a completely different issue. It's it's uh, it's that this is a personalized studio, so it's an application that basically you get when you check out precise. At some point, we could productize it if we want to, but it's a UI interface to the the whole process, so you don't have to actually ever hit the command line to create a model, train a model, test a model, stuff like that. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess my point is I don't want to 
to duplicate a lot of code. If, it means, if I'm gonna write something, a Selenium application that's gonna allow people to submit record samples, um, it sounds a lot like something you're, you know, part of the absolutely nothing to do with that. No, no, Chris, I think you're misunderstanding. This has nothing to do with that. This is assuming you have nothing and you want to create a custom white word. Okay. This takes you through the process with the UI. You're talking about okay. data pipeline. Okay. I don't know about that because our data sets are going to be quite large and that's voluminous. Um, we can talk about that later, but that was not my intent. Sorry. Yeah, that's it for me. Oh, hey. Can I request that uh, Charlie and I go? Because I think Charlie has to um, Charlie has to bug out for uh, some other. So, Charlie, Charlie, you there? Hey guys, can you hear me right now? I'm on the phone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Yeah, so give us a update on that. Yes, yeah, maybe you can't hear us. Okay. Um, okay, so what I did today and what I've been doing here this past week, I've finally been able to get back into um, I've finally been able to get back in the office and work. Um, we've just been finishing the prototypes. I know we sent out four or five, I believe. And then today we've been troubleshooting some of the prototypes. So um, whether it be the connectors or the software or um, the Raspberry Pi, we've just been trying to figure out, okay, what, what are some issues with the current ones? Because we've had some problems with, um, we've had some problems with the connectivity, sometimes they don't turn on, and we've just been trying to diagnose what is it about these um, about these prototypes that's not working. So in particular, we actually figured out that a couple of the mic ports are broken, and we probably need to order a couple more of those, we need to order a few more pies, but overall, it's just been a lot of troubleshooting the um, current ones. Yeah, so I'll just keep, I'll keep rolling with that. So yeah, we sent the four out to, um, to the project roller team and they were, they tested all fine, but the other three prototypes that were on the, you know, ready to go, they exhibited some issues. And so I didn't get them out the door. One of them we turned, turned out to be, and I haven't actually discovered what causes this, but it seems like the, um, Something that we were doing was resetting the power board that we were using because it's a it's an adjustable uh, voltage output, and so I we ended up frying some of the the pies or I did with uh, with that, and um, I believe that actually fried the mic boards as well. So we've been trying to recover from that to a certain degree, but it has um, it's kind of revealed some needs that we need to be able to tell if this is a hardware thing or if this is a software thing. And um, one of those things is the audio output. Uh, we've had this kind of known bug that I almost certainly saw again today where the audio output doesn't work initially on like a first boot. Um, and then maybe, I think today we even saw it or didn't work on the second boot. So it just makes it very difficult to determine, okay, is this the broken mic or is this, um, audio issue. So one idea I had on that was then I just created a task for it was just to create something simple. Like we just throw a wave file on the image and I can obviously I can just download one, but um, to just include something on a test file in the image that we can run outside of Microsoft software to see if audio output is, is working. Um, so some, some things like that we should be thinking about just so we can uh, determine because we go through this like oh is it a USB cable is it the mic board is it better? Derek, you have a uh, you have a sample wave file in Mycroft Core for the alert sound. Oh, okay, cool. All right, yeah, so we can just do that. We'll just do like a play and you know play wave file and see if the audio output is working.
Yeah, yeah great. Cool. cool. So, uh, so in addition to those devices, we're, we're also building an extra device for Michael. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to get that out the door tomorrow so he can have that for next week. Um, and then outside of that, I've been doing uh, a little bit of work. I added, a, I guess I should show you guys. I um, added some screenshots in Jira for some updates on the um, on the, the industrial design of the new uh, SJ-based prototype. And so if anyone wants to take a look, I've added it to uh, HR66 Industrial Design R2 on a, yeah, hold on a second. Yeah, let me share my screen here. Michael, while Derek's doing that, the, um, the fact that we can overload the voltage and burn out a board um, is disconcerting at best. Can't we put like a varistor or something there and limit it? Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, this was just, these are off the, this is from the off the shelf design. So this is a, like a board we're literally buying on Amazon and we have to, this little potentiometer, we have to set the voltage for. Um, and I know that we set it correctly. There's something that we were doing that's causing it to reset. Um, but once we get them all buttoned up and you know they're working and tested fully, I've never had an issue after that. But I haven't discovered what what we do in the process that has caused the few to reset, uh, which is just kind of weird. Definitely disconcerting. But um, yeah, that, that shouldn't be an issue once we move over to the. Uh, the new board. Really? Very nice. Yeah. All right. Sorry, guys. It's taking me a minute here. Um, okay. <clears throat> now, I showed this to, uh, I think I showed it to Ken last night. Okay, so this is um, kind of the front view. So you've got the screen is kind of a second module that can be removed to have a screenless version. And we've got four buttons across the top, one for action, one for uh, volume down, one for volume up, and one for muting the microphone. Um, and then on the back side, um, we've got a little channel here. The power actually plugs up vertically. Um, it's kind of designed so the board would maximize everything as much as possible beyond that same board. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of detailing to do. This is really still pretty pretty rough, but I thought I'd give you guys an update. You know, the grill pattern is kind of a placeholder for now. I'd like to, to work on that. Um, you know, there's not a lot of the finishing, like edge detailing, and you know, all that stuff. The lights will be in this area up here on top, and they will be in the kind of shape of the logo of, of Mycroft. So what I think I'd like, I'm going to try and do is put our logo kind of embossed in the center of that. So that's, that's where it is right now. And the screen itself is not fully these edges. It's going to be, you know, inset a little bit. So size-wise, uh, volume, it's really going to be smaller than the off-the-shelf design, but it's a little squatter and wider. Yeah. All right. So that's it for me. I'm gonna, uh, Kevin has been requesting to have something for him to put his first board prototypes in, so I'm also working on uh, getting at least something to, you know, it won't be, um, you know, form factor design, but something at least he can throw it in and, and be able to do some tests.
Okay, that was, that was a long way to, that was, that was me. Yeah. So uh, the good was I got a lot of, I spent a lot of time in Confluence um, documenting uh, some things around the upcoming uh, precise efforts. Um, so the uh, precise, uh, the base page for the precise folder has got like an overview in it um, of with all the different pieces and then there's links to the specific documents. Um, that uh, the detail of that information. Uh, so that's kind of set up and, and then uh, I did some work on the design of the first part, which is what we're gonna talk about later. Um, started to write the code even a little bit, um, just kind of, you know, uh, just some framework -y stuff, you know, getting a new uh, Flask app up and everything and so we need for, um, for precise, so, uh, so yeah, so I mean, good progress on, on that. Um, the coding, if we can agree on the design, the coding shouldn't take all that long for this part. It's really just like one endpoint and, um, and a database table, which I haven't designed yet. But uh, yeah, um, that's that's a good, um, the, not really any bad um, or ugly. Um, it's just still kind of um, an holding pattern here. I have been able to get more done uh, recently because I have my sister's here now, so she's been able to help me out a bit. So that's been helping to get more productive. So that's good. But yeah, hopefully I'll be out of here sometime in the next week. Oh, I'm sorry. One other thing I forgot to mention that's a good um, is we. I'm going. I'm, I'm reviewing a PR right now from OK that uh, that implements a plugin system for um, some of our services, like the audio service and the text to speech. Where we have all these different potential uh, solutions for each one, um, and we think a plugin system will help, so that people don't have to actually. Um, in fact, I'm not to change core to add a new option. Um, for like a TTS engine or a wakeboard engine. So um, I've been back and forth with OK on that a little bit. It was not quite done yet, but we're close. Um, I think that'll be a win um, as far as, you know, extensibility of core in the future. I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't get all of that. Um, let me make sure I understood what you said. Are you planning on changing the way that um, precise is delivered in core? No, well, basically instead of having um, like precise, I think, and, and other wakeboard engines right now are you know, like requirements for um, for core because they're they're all um, included in core, all the ones that we say we support now. So now what you're going to be able to do is say, I want to add you know, wakeboard recognizer X, I want core to be able to use that. So a plugin system where you can, you can install that that um, plugin. And then Core will recognize it using the setup.py file, some mechanics there, um, where you know there's like an auto detect and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think eventually we will probably move some of the existing ones out as well, so that everything's a plugin instead of having you know, one or two included and one or two not. But for now, basically we have the stuff that's included in Core continue to be included in Core, and if anything additional comes along, then we'll use a plugin system, and eventually we'll get to the point where everything's a plugin. As far as I think it's it's wakeboard STT and TTS, I think are the three uh, things okay. that using the system for. Okay, so um, on the, um, the wakeboard module, that's in the uh, wakeboard or hot words file, and uh, one of the first things that uh, Kay and I talked about was it's just too bloated. It's, it's it includes every wakeboard recognizer module in a big old file, and at a minimum, and at a minimum. It wouldn't take more than a couple of hours to take all of those and put them out as separate modules and then import them. So that's where I thought you were going. Okay, I get it. And that's kind of, that's kind of like what this is for. Is instead of importing them, though, they'd be some more of a plug-in system than an import system. Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay, that's... Yeah, so at the moment, 
as Chris was saying, like at the moment, the PR is for SCT, TTS, and audio services. But I think Wake Word has already been flagged as like another area where this would be really useful. Yeah, and another interesting possibility is uh, skills, maybe. If you change how we do skills from imports to the plugin system, that, that's just, you know, it's mentioned in the, in the PR description as something that we can possibly do, and we can talk about that down the line. But, um, hmm. but yeah, right now we have these factories where you can just include all kinds of different, uh, you know, technologies where you, where you can do these things with. So this will be a nice, a nice way to not have to worry about potentially doing something bad to core when you do a plugin. It's not built it's into a script. Go ahead, get started, I guess. Uh, yeah, so currently um, it's not built into the build script. Um, we leave a couple, we leave the sort of the core services that are actually in use um, uh, in core, and then you can add in additional ones. Um, but so Chris, as Chris suggested, we might change that so that the, all of the services are, are pulled out and so then in the script, you add whichever couple that you do like, um, that you do want to use. Um, but it does also mean that, that users can add, or skills could, could add a dependency, for example, of like, you know, I need this audio service to be able to, to operate um, and install that on the fly. So kind of both, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> Yeah, well, and uh, so the, the, the plan is to get the, the base system in um, now so that people can start using it uh, before we pull things out, which is going to be the break and change, uh, which will have to wait until 2008. But 2008 is not too far away, so I um, want to kind of see how this one goes in the wild first. Uh, no, the plan was, well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we'll be able to deploy this before 2008, but not pull out the services, not pull out the existing services. So you could then add in extra plugins um, without breaking the existing functionality. And then at 2008, we can pull out the services that are not essential, um, which would be breaking for some people. Uh, that sounded from Chris. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I'm also going to uh, document um, that system a bit so we can um, actually tell people what it's about before we before we ship it, um, which is a good thing. Uh, in terms of other stuff, um, well, on the TTS front, we added um, festival TTS um, support. Uh, which most people won't use, but it, it does provide on-device um, TTS for languages that aren't currently supported. So it was particularly getting pushed from our Catalan community, um, who are also working on, or maybe have already trained a, a neural uh, voice with Takatron 2. So, um, so, yeah, that's pretty exciting. Um, in terms of the... I don't think I have anything too ugly, but certainly some, some bad stuff is the, uh, well, stuff that's not progressing smoothly, at the very least. The service readiness stuff, which will help um, with, with what Derek was talking about before. Um, uh, yeah, we're still just, uh, the current plan is to, to shift the, um, the system readiness check to the enclosure. Um, currently, it's in the Fedacious service because it's the final thing that kind of happens. Um, and uh, going back and forth with OK, we're talking about adding a, a sort of um, 
a process status object to each of the different services um, so that there's a common interface for, for checking in with each of the services about um, what their status is um, and you know if they're ready or not. Um, uh, so yeah, Chris, um, good to get your eyes on that. Um, the skill API is something that's been around for a while, um, but it just never got merged. Um, uh, so I, I was reviewing that. So the idea is that you know if I've got an alarm skill, I can I can expose one of my methods as an as an API for other skills on the device. Um, so that, you know they can use an alarm without having to code their own alarm piece into their own thing. Uh, yeah, so it's mostly good. Um, I just, just found a couple of issues, so um, I'll okay, face having another pass at that. Um, and uh, been doing some. Um, oh, I've been trying to get the the new a new um, QC image um, uh, packaged up. I, I busted the script um, with the Mimic two caching. I think so. Um, uh, been again chatting with Okay, who's on holidays at the moment, to do a lot of micro stuff. Um, uh, so hopefully, I'll be able to get. I'm, I'm hoping that I'll have one of those images uh, by the end of today. Um, um, and then the only other thing is that um, uh, El Pacino has been um, doing some TPS training for us using our Georgian data set that we kind of shelved um, when we. Scale back, um, and since it's been sitting there not doing anything, uh, we thought that yeah, he could he could have a go at it. Um, so he's he's trying it out with um, with Takatron too as well. Uh, um, we're just yeah getting access to some of the original data um, from Steve, and so um, still pushing pushing on that. Uh, but there's some early results, so. Um, yeah, hopefully that goes well, and we'll, we'll have a, a new U.S. Um, female voice at some point. Hey, Gaz, are you? Um, did you leave that uh, model I gave you installed, or did you go back to the old one? Oh no, I'm I'm, I'm all, all the way on the new model. That was yeah. Did you uh, change the settings, or did you leave them at their defaults? So the sensitivity and trigger. Uh, I left them as what you suggested. Oh, okay, so 0 0.1 and 7. Okay, so, so you are using that. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to follow up on that. I am finding one issue. Anyway, this is not the right place to about that. I, I've got one issue with that. But. <laughs> uh, I'm just, uh, so, so there's a, you can turn on recording of, um, of wake words, like locally, so you store all the, um, all the recordings for yourself, um, uh, and for some reason, uh, it's they're all super truncated, so, um, which is going to be an issue when we try and use them for training, obviously. Um, so instead of getting hey micro, you will just get Croft. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure if it's related to the new model or something in core that's changed. Um, so I need to dig into that a bit. Yeah, and um, are, is, it, is it leading, is it, is it truncating leading or trailing? Leading. Leading, okay, interesting. Um, that so might you get the cross, or even just the T of the, of the wake word, so you don't get the start. If, if you switch out the models, I bet you that behavior will continue. Um, I believe that was always the way it was. That's in the mic.py. Yeah, I saw that too. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, nothing significant. Um, rollout, the rollout people are pretty reasonably happy. The, uh, I did have some good conversations with a couple of uh, uh, potential customers that are interested in doing some interesting things, and hopefully uh, the community hear about some of them soon.
Yeah, yeah the readiness. Well, I'd like to wait and get some more feedback, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to add a Lakewood beta button to the Selenium interface and let people download it. I read it. Yeah, I was, I was concerned about that too, because actually that data or that page probably needs to be part of the data pipeline page. So, Yeah, and actually I, I used some of this documentation as a starting point. Um, so but the thing with the data pipeline document is that it's it's huge. Um, there's a lot in there. And I was kind of hoping to break it up into smaller pieces. So maybe there could be a link to this document in the data pipeline document. Because the data pipeline goes all the way from collection to, to tagging. And I was hoping to address each of those separately as far as how we're going to implement them. Um, yeah, no, that know, sounds, in their yeah, that sounds like that'll keep that page more sane. But maybe just embed a link in there to that page would be good. Sure. Kind of like I did with the precise top page where there's links to the more detailed documents, um, you know, in that. And maybe, I, I don't know, what I did to the precise top page may be um, similar to what that data pipeline thing is too. So we just need to probably figure out how we want to present um, this information, I guess, you know, the best way to use, to use our tools to, you know, to present the information we want to present. Yeah, I had assumed you had already read everything that I put out there and you were just basically uh, restructuring it. And I saw some of the edits you made. So I, I mean, I really don't have many, many comments on it. I just, you know, contribute what I can and then like, let you guys go ahead and run with it. So that's fine.
Well, I, I want it to be part, um, and there's, to me, there's, that's a separate document as far as the design of that web page, and now we're going to collect. So it's probably going to have some sort of link to that. Um, so really, I just wanted to say this is a tool we're going to have um, that allows us to collect things on a diff in a different way, but I didn't want to go into too much detail because that was going to be a separate design. This is really just how... And maybe, maybe I could include more information about that in this document because it's a part of collection. Um, but I haven't given it much thought. Well, Michael, uh, Michael, speaking to your, your first point, the precise roadmap, I think, is the scope of the project. And I think there's about six or seven items on the precise roadmap. And I think I tried to put them in uh, priority order or execution order. Um, but, yeah. Uh, and Chris, you know, we were talking a little bit briefly before the meeting, probably now is the time to surface it. The, um, the index files that I alluded to, the rationale for them, uh, and you're absolutely right, um, if we decide to uh, go with the database, uh, then there's, they're basically kind of superfluous. There's, there's reasons why they're not that we can get into technically, but they're kind of superfluous. Um, you have to understand that my approach with almost everything is that if there is an existing system, my, I try to layer on top of it without modifying the existing project. So the index files were a way to layer on additional classification attributes to the data sets without having to modify the schema. So the existing um, collection mechanism could stay unscathed and untouched and then the index files would be able to, you'd be able to use the index files to find pitch classified versus, you know, other classifieds versus whatever attributes uh, without modifying the schema of the database. Um, there was a table I was going to add to the database which would add a path to the files since the current database doesn't consider that and assumes everything's in one big old subdirectory. And um, right now, that's what's causing us the most pain. And so they ha that has to be changed. They have to be moved out to smaller directories. We can't have directories with a million and a half files in them. It's just ridiculous. It it's what causes the kind of you know, aggravation I'm dealing with now. And um, so the index files were a way to address that, as well as a separate um, join table that would have a domain table of paths. And, a, uh, and then a index key into the actual data file um, table. So all that would be layered on top without modifying the existing system. The intent being you could simply take it, redeploy it somewhere else, incorporate it in Selenium, and bada bing, bada boom, everything would work. But if we're going to go and change the schema and modify that code, then all bets are off. So that's what the index files were about. Exactly. In other words, um, it's part of the, uh, the accountability or reproducibility trail or audit trail, whatever you want to call it. So when you create a model in my world, uh, what it does is it, it basically you give it an index file and there's, there's tools to combine index files, right? And so you can say, you know, combine these five index files, give me a big old master index file. That's what I'm going to train off of. Now store that in the model's description, you know, in its directory structure. And now you know all the files that went into the training of that model. Um, it also helps across contamination and stuff. So, you know, they serve multi-purposes, but if you don't mind modifying the schema and if you don't mind, you know, constantly updating the domain of things that you're tagging, then, they're, then it's, it's superfluous. But I still think they're good to have. But that's just my two cents. Yeah, so just from a from a high level, my thoughts are more along, you know, everything is done a certain way in Selenium as far as how endpoints are created and 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 with the with the use of the library code. So um, there are going to be some changes to how you know. In my mind, this is a a bit of every architecture as well. 
Well, now, wait a minute, Chris. You, didn't you tell me that Selene was simply a repository structure? Yes. <laughs> it is a repository. I, mean, I, could, I could just throw some code in there. I could just throw, take the code and throw it in there. But it would be it would be kind of a, a black sheep as far as the way the other Selene APIs are coded. Okay, I, I understand. You're, you're trying to keep a, a synergy across all of the products and all of the code across the code base, right? Yeah, so, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before, and I, I, I don't know what executive management's opinion is on this, but I do want um, to have a better um, holistic, you know, uh, way, a holistic architecture and you know, have things be done the same way as much as possible rather than having you know, all these different things that different people did over time just mushed together. Um, so and that's kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing. But isn't the existing tagger and the existing uploader a Flask app anyway? There's a Flask app in a separate... Um, repository, yeah. so bring it into the yeah. repository. I'm missing why it would be a black sheep if you did that. <clears throat> um, so a couple of different reasons. One is there's, you know, we wouldn't be using, we'd be using a different database. Um, so there's a whole data access layer that all the APIs and Selenium use and share that, um, that that code doesn't use and share right now. And they all use the same database? Yes. They have different schemas, but they're all the same database. So this would be a different schema inside the precise database. Um, and just the way the APIs are structured as far as um, just from a coding standpoint, how the like, file structures and stuff would be very different. So, Do the APIs take JSON as input? There's, yeah, there's JSON request objects. Which is... Right, because we could probably take it offline. I mean, I mean, I'd like, I'd like, over, I'd like to chat. The overarching thing is, is, the, is architecturally, or just from an effort standpoint, I mean, if, if we want to do, like, I mean, and this is the higher level thing, we can figure out the details later, but the higher level, do we just want to take what we have and put it in a different repository and, you know, deal with the fact that there's, you know, some differences between that and the way we do things elsewhere, or do we want a cohesive um, architecture, or do we want to put off making a piece of architecture later and just throw this up over there in the short term and go back and maybe, you know, do that later. It's really a scope thing. I mean, I, I could do what, exactly what Ken had described and just take the code, throw it in this repository and, and you know, make it work. Um, yeah, it's, probably, it's probably a time issue, right? I mean, if, if you take it and drop it in the, new, in the new repository and leave it as is, that would take a day. How long would it take to re-architect? It probably isn't gonna take that long, right? It's not that much code. There aren't that many endpoints, but I mean, it's, it's an overarching question is, you know, because we're going to run into this a lot, um, you know, where things were done a certain way before, um, before, and, you know, maybe you want them to architect them differently or go forward differently. No, I don't think so. But again, there's not that many endpoints. So the code itself, um, the biggest thing is going to be the, the schema and how we store the data um, and how that's going to work. But um, the actual API itself is not that large. Yeah, and the schema, um, the schema that we have now, um, you and I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but um, did you have an opportunity to review it? The stuff I sent you? Yes, a little bit. Um, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a thin grasp on how it's how it's working right now. Um, but again, um, that so the, the, the data design of the Selenium database is very um, intentionally like for normal for me and I mean very databasey. Um, this is kind of like the way it is now is not. Um, not, I guess, what I would consider a well-designed database, or no well-designed schema. So again, um, you know, if we want to take what I would consider a poor design and just port it, fine. We can do that and maybe fix it later, maybe never fix it. 
Um, but I, I'm never a fan of letting poor architecture live. Well, that's just the way I am. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine, but two questions real quick, just brief. Um, is there something that you are aware of that's on our roadmap that the existing schema would handle? And in what way is the existing schema um, poor in your, in your opinion? Uh, just again, it's just that it's, it's not follow. It doesn't follow the data, the data design methodologies that I like to follow. What does that um, mean? As far, um, normalized data. But it is normalized. Um, adding another table that just has file names that links to a, to a table that exists is not normalized data. Adding, I'm, I'm confused. There's, there's not. There's a, there's a table that has the file name and all of the join values for all of the other tables. It has the index into the wake words, into the tag counts, into the final tag ID. Uh, it is a normalized database, and there's no data that's duplicated across that, except in the file name itself, because that's where the account ID and the model and the time and all that is derived from, and the other tables are populated. But when that row is put in, there are indexes, foreign keys, into every one of those tables. That's why I'm confused as to what about that design is so offensive to you. Well, there's also stuff we need to add. Um, maybe I need to take a closer look at it, but we also need to add um, whatever the new um, classification parameters are. So, Right, which would be a new entry in the... Um, in those domain tables, right? But we don't even have to do that if we just use index files, which is where I was going with that. But okay, anyway, I just wanted to understand. My, I'm sorry. Okay, I mean, it sounds like we're on the same page as far as scope of the project goes. I think it's a, these are implementation details, what these are. I was going to ask about the whole anonymous contribution space, um, because it's something that the community has asked for. Um, my assumption is that the, this being a Selenium application, it would require authentication like the other endpoints do. Um, is it something that we could like have the old tag of you know being available for people to contribute anonymously or do you think it's totally outside the scope of what we're doing the old tag is sorry go ahead
Well, anonymous anonymous contributions for uh, uploading raw data is probably not a great idea. I thought Gez was referring to anonymous contributors of tag tagging. That I don't see a problem with. Tagging wasn't completely anonymous though, because we had that leaderboard. We knew who you know who who at least tagged how many. <laughs> No, but I'm just saying some people might no, want to talking, participate. But yeah, I, I, so I was talking more about like the the Rafi Rafi project, um, and uh, there's, there's a few, there's a number of people that use Microsoft without the back end at all, um, and uh, there are people that have said that they would be happy to upload um, samples of the of wake word or you know that it, they're probably more interested in that other stuff that you're doing can around you know um being able to develop their own their own wake words um so it, it potentially fits closer into that than in in this which is you know the um continual improvement of our active wake word um models um so maybe, I mean, potentially it's also just not worth the effort when we're talking about a small number of users, you know, doing this other um, process versus the vast majority of our, well, you know, 15% of our users or, or however many um, that are up to the end. Um, you know, maybe we're not talking about enough data samples to, to really warrant the extra effort. Um, and well, it's not the more, more automated solution, but they could certainly manually ship them to us, and then we could manually track them. Yeah, I think for people like the Rousey Project, it's it's not going that like they they're not they're not essentially collecting their users' data either. So they want to provide a, a mechanism for their users to contribute to individually contribute their data to Microsoft if if they want to do that. They're all of their users. Without having a Microsoft account, yeah, because they're like Rusty is a is a fully offline kind of a thing. Um, there's no you don't need an account to use it for anything. Um, so, but if people were happy to provide, uh, they have a lot of people um, suggesting that they'd be happy to provide wakeward data, um, and you know that, that want to develop new precise models and improve their precise models. Um, and if the way that they can do that is to contribute data to us, then, then they're happy to do that. Yeah, um, so, so, let, so let me weigh in on that. So the, the, so I hear a couple of themes in this. Um, number one, the, the first question is, do we want to abstract the data collection in a way that allows us to use this same collection mechanism for multiple different forms of data? So for example, we're using it to bring in the wake word spotting stuff, but that is like literally the easiest problem in machine learning. Like hot dog, not a hot dog. Like they made a whole, a whole series of episodes of Silicon Valley about it, right? Um, you know, but we do have other data that we're going to want to collect. So eventually, we're going to want the audio utterance, like the entire command, right? So that we can use that to improve the the speech to text. Um, and, you know, we're probably going to want the text of that command as well so that we can feed it to something that looks like Rasa, which might actually end up being Rasa, uh, so that we can improve the natural language understanding. Um, and then finally, we, we may at some point have a desire to take uh, uh, end user utterances um, and use them to clone voices, right? So we, we may actually grab those audio samples, tie them to the text, and you know, simply by using Mycroft over a period of time, we gain the ability or we, we give you the opportunity to, to uh, replicate your voice. Um, you know, all of that data really belongs in my mind in the same repository. I don't know how it's organized within that repository, but a your data page inside of Mycroft's uh, inside of Cellini, where people can go and see their wake word utterances, they can go and see their commands, they can go and see any audio or any text transcriptions that we have for them, and then have control of that data to either delete it or not. As part of that page, I think it's very appropriate for us to allow the Raspi community, who would indeed have to create an account to do this, but they wouldn't have to use that account every day, but when they decided they wanted to upload 50,000 samples, for example, they could go to a Mycroft, uh, uh, they could go to the Mycroft uh, 
a Selini website, they could log in and then we would have a bulk upload tab or something where they click the button and they can upload 50,000 utterances. And, and frankly, they want that, right? Because the, the, the tagging stuff can indeed be done anonymously, although we should think that through carefully because we are doing double double tagging, but it's not all that hard given the volume of users for people to create two anonymous accounts and deliberately reach in and screw our data up, right? Like always always assume that, that there's somebody out there that's being vindictive, right? So we'd probably want to tag tie the tagging activity back to an individual account, even if we don't know who's on the other end of that account. But in terms of bulk uploads, they want that because someday they might want to not make that data available, right? So, and if they can't tie it, you know, if, if we're taking anonymous data from the Raspi community, how do we know that that data came from somebody who signed the end user license agreement? How do we know what the permissions is? So like, that's just a random chunk of data. We don't know what the hell to do with it. And, and, and it gets away from our core principle of giving the end, per, the end um, user control of their data. So in a bulk upload scenario, it's, it's a pretty similar to, to any of these other upload scenarios. And so, you know, I can see five separate categories of data that we're gonna wanna track immediately. You know, wakeward spotting is number one. Um, the actual audio samples is number two. The audio sample tied to the text example is number three. Bulk uploads is number four. And then manual data entry is number five. And by net manual data entry, I mean going to the Celine website and recording their their wake word recordings through the website, not through an end device. And and the, the fifth category actually would encompass the other four. So they could submit wake word samples, they could submit full speech commands, they could tie those speech commands to text. And then, uh, well, I guess it only incorporates the other three. And so that becomes a full on application within Celine that allows the end users to control their data. So the question I heard Chris Veyer ask is, do we want to build this now? And uh, my response to that is probably yes, is that the, in my view, this application is really co goes to the very core of what we're doing as a company. The, uh, you know, deploying a useful piece of technology, using that useful piece of technology to collect data in an ethical way, tagging, categorizing, and manipulating that data so that we can use it to improve the technology and then using the improved technology to further expand our reach for technology usefulness and grow the community. And that becomes this this hamster wheel that, that Chris Gesling's always talk about, this self-reinforcing wheel that, that drives forward the company. So, you know, I think that we've been down this path too often with like, hey, let's issue some technical debt and just bang it out. Um, you know, if we can build that application in a reasonable time frame, I'm a big fan of getting that done. Yeah, so I guess, Chris V, that answers your question. <laughs> as long as Michael agrees with that assessment. <laughs> that, that's not my call, that's Michael's call. I want to have one. <laughs> that's just his opinion. Yeah, I mean, right now, from what, yeah, I mean, right now, from what I heard uh, from Josh, there's like five components of which two are already done, and the trade-off is, does Chris just take the two as is and put them in the same repository, or does he look at the entire five components and see if it's going to make more sense to abstract this stuff out, so that, in other words. Is it going to be better if Chris spends the time up front and then the next four modules come faster, right? Because that's kind of where I think he's going, is that if he can, you know, re-architect this and make it more modular and more Selene-like, and it's, and it's you know, basically he's re had a chance to re-architect the first two, the next three will be cookie cutter is what I think I'm hearing. Yeah, and not only that, but the old the old taggers in React, and then you know all of our Selene stuff is in Angular. So that, at the very least, will have to be um, reworked. And there's also stuff we need to add to it anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. But um, 
Uh, yeah, and the, 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 the contribution website, or contribution page is a brand new thing. So it doesn't really matter, that just has to be built. Um, so really what it comes down to is the existing things we have, you know, what, you know, what do we do with those? So, um, you know, do we spend a little time cleaning them up or do we just, yeah. And, 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 let's, and let's abstract that stuff away because there, there are other things, like once we have all that data tagged, for example, we can empower the users to use biometrics, right? Like once we have enough audio data for an individual end user, we can say, um, you know, we can tie a specific audio sample back to that user if they want us to, right? Um, I think the other two things we should be thinking of because our friends at Amazon goofed this when they deployed the Amazon Prime video, um, I, I think that we should consider family members as part of this abstraction, right? So I have an account, right? But, you know, the audio samples that are flowing into my account probably encompass my wife and my children as well. So we probably want some mechanism of dividing those out for that end user, right, as part of that. So I'm going to throw that in the chat too. And then uh, I think we want to be uh, data agnostic with, with how we're dealing with this stuff. So you know, another thing we're probably going to want eventually is is pictures of the end user because the, the Mark II has a camera and there are scenarios where, and, and I want to just highlight this because across the board, this is the policy, only if the end, one, end user wants to use the feature, right? Like, and the data belongs to them, they control it, they consent to it. Like, you know, we're building features that do incorporate a lot of this potentially very privacy intrusive technology but we're doing it in a way that, that allows people to control whether or not they use it. So now let me step to facial recognition. You know, the Mark II should have a camera on it, and so there is a scenario where the end user wants to tie, you know, visual visual data back to that account so that, um, you know, Christopher Rogers, uh, who has a fantastic name, um, uh, so that Christopher Rogers, when he's wandering around his magic wood using his uh, Wake Look technology, if you remember that demo, where you can just look at the Mark One and it, it puts it in a listening mode, um, that that would, you know, be able to not only work for whoever's in the room, but tie that individual uh, face back to a specific account so that when I look at it and say, play Spotify, it plays, you know, whatever, um, uh, what was I listening to the other way? Oh, George Michael. It plays whatever George Michael uh, uh, album I was listening to last. Uh, I did just admit that on video. Um, <laughs> yeah. Haven't seen the movie Piano? George Michael is in. There you go. Um, but if the uh, you know if my daughter looks at it, it plays whatever um, uh, rando. I, I honestly have gotten so old I can no longer name any of the any of the artists she listens to. Uh, whatever the latest Taylor Swift album is, right? So, um, you know, all of that, it, you know, and I, there are probably, you know, tens, dozens, potentially hundreds of other data points that we're going to want to collect and categorize. Um, so I think we should abstract it away in a way that allows us to basically tie generic piece of data back to, you know, a specific account and then tie validation related to that data back to specific accounts. And so an individual piece of data, you know, even today with our applications may be tied to three separate accounts. You know, I contributed it through, oh, four. I contributed it through my device, right? It's actually data that's tied to my daughter. So that's the second identity. Um, you know, somebody in the community, Derek tagged it the first time and then Chris G tagged it the second time. So that individual piece of data has actually been touched by four people, right? And we're probably gonna wanna keep track of that because if we find out, um, that, you know, Derek is, is actually deliberately reaching in to, to uh, uh, miscategorize data and that he's in cahoots with Chris G, um, you know, we, we want to be able to back those tags out, right? So, we're, we're, you know, well, and that's not, we're small enough that those types of overlaps are going to happen at our scale, right? So, you know, let's not give people the power to deliberate. I mean, we haven't had any bad behavior there, but the whole reason we have security problems on the internet is everybody who invented it assumed that everybody would be on good behavior. So, um, so let's just assume that at every step of that process, the end, the end user is malicious and build it with that in mind. Yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to say was on this kind of topic is, to me, consistency and um, cohesion are kind of important when we talk about having to, to maintain this stuff over the long term. So if we can be consistent about how we do things, 
Uh, and we, we weren't before. We, you know, the, the past of Minecraft has been everyone in their silo do things, doing things their own way. And that's why we have all, this, all these very differently architected things sitting out there. So um, I'd like to get to a point where everything is, is thought through to a point where, you know, if you, if you see a piece of code in Cellini, you know exactly what you're looking for and where you're looking for it. And it, it, it'll happen. It'll help the amazing cycles going forward. So that, that's kind of some of that's going from too. Yeah, but Josh, you have to realize that to the best of my knowledge, at least from the two pieces of code associated with this process that I've seen, none of that auditability currently exists in this code base. Yeah, so if we're going to spend $150,000, you know, doing this, which is what it'll, you know, that's what two months of Mycroft costs, right? It was 150 grand. Um, let's make sure that out the other side pops something that is maintainable and it doesn't have all this technical debt. The, um, the past is history, right? So, um, so let's work on on being consistent going forward. And and you're right. Like I, the, the original version of that I hacked to get. Like I, I said it several times. I hacked it together in an afternoon. Like yeah, it's broke. It, it was just intended to be a stopgap. Um, you know, now that we're moving it into a real production piece of software and thinking it through, let's let's do that carefully. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, that, that guest thing is a, is a really important one too. Like that's something that the others just totally don't want to don't want to touch with a ten foot pole. And I'm assuming the kids thing too is is you know there's, there's special requirements when you're collecting when you know you're collecting data from from kids. Um, and so I think you know they just go by the by the route that like you know no no young people are using our software, which is clearly false because they've got like games and shit. Oh, I, think, I think their attitude is, the attitude is probably much more along the lines of we're so big we don't care if the law says that we can't collect kids like if you want to do something about it we'd happily pay your fine as a cost of doing business right um but they you know remember that they have also and the bigger platforms made a lot of progress at tagging bio tagging things biometrically and so you know, the, they, they may be able to suss some of that stuff out. Um, that's the last thing. I added all the, the line items I talked about into the chat. Um, the last thing that if we can do it would be great is if we have an utterance and we can figure out what actually triggered on that utterance and grab it, um, obviously with permission, um, that would give it, that would be very, very helpful at helping us to suss out the NLU. So knowing that when I said, uh, play Huey Lewis in the news, it triggered the news skill instead of Spotify to listen to, you know, the, the early 80s band um, would be very helpful for us to go through and, and resolve issues inside the NLU stack. So it may make sense for us to grab the resulting behavior if, if we can figure that out. Um, just as I have the anonymous contribution bit that sort of then he kicks this off as well. Um, it sounds like that's not that's not something that we can prioritize. It's not something that we're going to be building into to the stack at any point in the near future. And so, if community members want to provide uh, data from outside of Microsoft, they need to sort of collect that up and and do the bulk upload or create an account and. Uh, and remember, we're not we're not doing any account verification there, right? So if they want to create the account using Tor and create the username anonymous 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 and submit that data through that anonymous channel, like that data is still anonymized, right? But it just ties it back to an account. So if the data is total crap, we can reach into the system and say, delete all data that was submitted by this user because this user is submitting a bunch of malicious data. Right, so, so it's, it's not, not that, that we won't take it anonymously; it's that we won't take it without an account. Good 
good distinction. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm sorry. I was muted again. God damn it. How do you how do you discern that you know somebody is a guest on on you know didn't didn't do an agreement? That's that's a tough one. Oh, so they could go into their data and say, oh, this was so and so, and delete it. Basically. Okay. That, that's that's the part I was a little fuzzy. I'm like, we, we have to do that. That's a huge project. Okay. For the purposes of what I'm doing right now, if, if somebody walks in and says, hey, Mycroft, and activates, and you need to sign an agreement, that's just, <laughs> that's included in your data. It'd be the same as Google Photos. Like, if I upload Google, a bunch of photos, they, they, they are able to tie all of the pictures together and tell me that this face is in these 1,500 pictures, but they don't know who that face is until I type a name in. You know, we eventually, if we're doing our jobs right, we should be able to go through and say there are 15,000 utterances in your account, and they're from these, you know, 98% of them are from these four users. Can you give us a name and an age for each one of these users so that we can, um, you know, if the age is, if it's inappropriate for us to keep them because they're underage so that we can nuke them, right? Um, or so that we can tie them back to, uh, you know, name, age, and gender would be really helpful because then we actually name, age, gender, and dialect would be a, an enormously helpful contribution from our community because then we could say, hey, this is somebody who speaks Indian English, is 41 years old and female, and we could use that to improve the speech speech recognition, right? Um, so, so we can we can eventually go through those utterances and categorize them and tie them back to a you know a family member, and then it's up to the end user, as always, to determine what they want to do with the data. If they trust us to use it for the benefit of the overall technology stack, great. If they don't, you know, they'll have the power to delete it and to not opt in, and then we won't even have the data in that case. So. Okay, so from what I'm hearing right now, as I build it, we're gonna assume that people have us a, an account with us for, the, for this data, whether through a device or through using the Selene um, application. Yes. Okay. Okay. And there'll be this, this will be part of the account page they go to, and they should be able to see all the data on their account. And uh, you know, we should be able to provide them with the ability to uh, to tag data, right, and earn points of some kind. The, yeah, the kind of yeah. yeah. But that's the, further down the road. Like my current focus is just getting precise data tagged and possibly contributed to, and all that that we're talking about now, specific to Precise, will require an account. Yeah, you have to have an account. We probably want to do the family members thing now since we're collecting the data. Um, and then we need a tool for people to, to tag the data. The rest of this can probably wait. Um, okay. As long as when we build that, we abstract, it, we abstract it away enough that we'll be able to add other data types and other tagging uh, workflows to the to the system the other thing you may want to do before we go and reinvent the wheel is spend a half an hour on the google and see if somebody has already built this entire system for us and we could just plug it the hell in it very well may exist out there because there's a lot of companies solving the same problem you need the wake word the problem of collecting data from users tagging it using using uh uh whatever supervised learning categorizing it storing it like that that's there are there are tons of companies doing at this out in the machine learning space so there may be a hell there may be an open source framework that that has all these abstractions already thought through and is available as a an api who, oh, who knows but it, may make it would still have to be modified to fit into the selene infrastructure is what i'm hearing yeah i probably would but you know if somebody else has a wheel i would rather not invent it over again i i will look Yeah, so my, my approach to that was going to be since the contribution web page is a brand new um, 
And part of the reason it's not sussed out in the document that I wrote is because it's brand new. Um, I was gonna port the stuff we have first, like port the, you know, get the mic, get the device based stuff working with Selene and get the tagger working in Selene because those are known entities. And then um, build like, that would be like a last thing would be building this brand new uh, contribution system, which is why that isn't really sussed out in the, in the um, design document. Um, I could approach it differently and just get contribution done completely, <laughs> you know, um, and get that, that section done so we can say this is how you contribute data. That's fine too. That's just, I just want to tell you how I was approaching it. And if you want to tell me to approach it differently, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> or do we care? <laughs> Okay. I, I can at the very least add. Yeah. Okay, I'll give that a thought too. And Ken, you know, I should probably maybe tomorrow spend some time talking about, you know, the, this document in particular and how it differs from what you've put together so far and, and what we want to, you know, we want to be going out the other end. Sure, when it's convenient for you, ping me. All right. Go team. Yeah, have a good weekend, everybody. Yes. That's right. Go forth and do great things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. See you.